The next set of slides, we're going to continue with multi-arm bandits, but now I will introduce Bayesian bandits as well as contextual bandits. Okay, so Bayesian bandits is going to be um, a better way to uh, characterize the uncertainty because here the idea is that whenever we select actions to explore or exploit, the idea is that really what we should be doing is estimating what is our uncertainty and then when we want to explore, we should be exploring whenever we've got lots of uncertainty and we should be exploiting when we have very little uncertainty when we're starting to be certain, right? And then so one way of explicitly doing this is by modeling the uncertainty um, with a distribution and this will lead to this notion of Bayesian bandits. And then um, another important type of bandit, oops, yeah, another important type of bandit are going to be contextual bandits. These are bandits uh, where we take into account the context so that we can make more informed decisions. And in practice, in industrial settings, these are the ones that tend to be used. Okay, so for those slides, then again, I will introduce Bayesian bandits. In particular, we'll see one algorithm known as Thomson sampling. And then after that, we'll talk about contextual bandits. Okay, so just as a quick recap, we just talked about uh, multi-arm bandits where we define the problem as follows. We have n bandits, or if you prefer, n actions, and then each one of them has an unknown reward. Um, so the average reward would be R of A, but we don't know what it is. Now, the question is, what is the arm or action A that we should play at each step so that we maximize our average reward? And then to find a good answer to this, we need to explore, but at some point we also need to exploit, so we have this exploration exploitation trade-off. Okay, so then in terms of algorithms, we talked about epsilon greedy and upper confidence bound. Those two techniques are known as frequentist techniques. But now we're going to see um, an alternative technique that is based on the Bayesian principle where we're going to model explicitly our uncertainty and then select actions uh, whenever we notice that we have lots of uncertainty um, and to, well, to explore and otherwise to exploit. Uh, so there's various approaches as well for, uh, in, in the Bayesian camp. We're going to talk about one of them, Thonson sampling. But then, historically, there's another one that is very important based on Gittin's indices. But um, in any case, we won't have time to, to talk about that. OK, so for Bayesian bandits, I need to introduce the notion of Bayesian learning. Here, the idea is that um, we have some rewards. I'm going to denote the reward that we obtain at each step whenever we execute an action as a random variable. So here, RA is going to be a random variable. And now, because it's a random variable, we're going to express a distribution. So initially, before I execute this action, I, I don't know what is going to be the reward. So I have perhaps lots of uncertainty. And this uncertainty, I could model it with a distribution. Okay, so probability of RA is going to be the distribution here. And this distribution is going to be parameterized by theta. Um, now, what we're interested in is to find the expectation of that random variable. And here, RA denotes this expectation. So this is the mean or average reward. OK, so in the case of uh, Bayesian bandits, what we're trying to do is to express uh, our uncertainty about theta through a prior distribution over theta. So here, you see, if we knew what theta was, that would give us the distribution of the rewards that we can expect for a certain arm. And then we could compute easily what is the mean, and then we would know how to um, select actions optimally. So the main problem here is that we don't know what is this distribution? And in particular, it means we don't know what are the parameters that govern this distribution. 
So from that perspective, what we should be doing is now trying to estimate what is this theta. And again, if we don't know what theta is, perhaps we can express a distribution with respect to theta as well. So this will be the Bayesian approach to, to bandits, where we're going to start with a prior distribution that reflects our belief about how this distribution might be governed by possible uh, parameters theta. So here, yeah, we'll start with a prior distribution. Then we'll observe various outcomes of the random variable. So each time I execute uh, the action, let's say on the first shot, I get reward R1. On the second shot, perhaps I get reward R2, and, and so on. Now all of those um, observations, I can use them to refine my belief about theta. And then the idea is that in the long run, right, I should be able to converge and, and find what is the, the true theta by having a distribution that becomes peaked at this theta. So, so here we'll compute a posterior distribution and, and then as we increase our, our samples, then we'll see this distribution that will simply become more peaked over time. Okay, so to do this, to compute this posterior, we're going to use Bayes' theorem. So this is why it's called Bayesian learning, because we're going to use Bayes' theorem. And then Bayes' theorem is essentially saying that to compute the posterior, all we need to do is to multiply the prior by the likelihood, where here the likelihood is simply a distribution over the rewards that can be obtained um, under the parameterization theta. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so Bayes' theorem um, is very fundamental and it's um, a nice way of, of showing how we can update distributions whenever we've got some data. Uh, so here, the idea is that we start with a prior distribution. After we obtain some data, we want to compute a posterior distribution, which will be a revised distribution with respect to theta. And this posterior uh, according to Bayes' theorem, is, is essentially proportional to the product of the prior times the likelihood. Okay, so now if we compute a posterior distribution um, over theta, then we can use this to also make some prediction about the next reward that we could obtain in the sequence. So here, um, the rewards are obtained from this distribution that's governed by theta. We're trying to estimate theta, we're making progress, let's say, but then at any point in time we could ask, based on our belief about what theta might be, can we make a prediction about what the next reward might be? And, and then so we can do this type of prediction um, according to this equation here. So here I've got my posterior distribution, and then given a specific theta, I can also um, estimate what will be the, the next reward. So now, since I don't know what theta is, I will simply take an integral um, to compute a prediction of my next reward, given the rewards that I've seen so far. Uh, sorry, say that again. So, so you go back to the previous first slide, okay. So in the second line, like the, the probability is not more. Common. Yeah. So how do you make, how do you compute the integral? Right, so okay, so here the distribution is unknown in the sense that I don't know what theta is. Okay. Now on this slide, what I'm saying is I still don't know what theta is, and that's why I've got a posterior distribution here that expresses what is my belief about what might be theta. And now to make predictions, normally if I knew what theta was, then the prediction would just be given by this distribution. But now I might need to consider all kinds of possible thetas because I don't know which one is the correct one. But then these possible thetas are gonna be weighted by the posterior and, and essentially this integral is kinda like taking a weighted combination of those distributions based on different possible thetas, each one weighted by the posterior. 
Yeah. So yeah. So even though in this expression, right, it looks like oh, I am using uh, a distribution that's unknown because I don't have theta, right? The fact that I multiply by this 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 other posterior here, now I express the fact that I don't know what theta is. Yeah. Okay. So. So this is the distribution over the next reward, but in my case, what I'm really interested in is to make an estimate or, or to predict what, what is really the average reward. Right? So we define R of A to be the average reward, and then so in the same way, um, we, can, um, as we, well, we can show that um, the prediction here is, is going to be based on, on simply the posterior. So the way I've defined this is that theta uh, does correspond to the average reward. And then so a distribution over theta is essentially a distribution over the average reward. OK, so now um, to guide the exploration, you see we, we've seen already the UCB algorithm, the upper confidence bound. So Earlier, I, I kind of just showed you an equation based on um, Hofting's inequality. But Hofting's inequality, the way to arrive at it is that you could say, well, let's, let's come up with a distribution over uh, this mean reward and then see if we can uh, come up with a bound uh, that would capture most of the, most of the distribution. So you see, I can modify this to say that now the probability that Ra is going to be less than some bound should be greater or equal than 1 minus delta. So this was the upper confidence bound technique. So it's simply comparing Ra to a bound. But then Bayesian techniques, we don't compare Ra to a bound. We simply work with the full distribution. And, and now we're going to essentially select actions based on the full distribution as opposed to a bound. And, and this can lead to um, more accurate techniques and, and also um, a, a variety of, of techniques. Say that again. What's the contribution What's over the contribution of the second equation? The second equation? Yeah. What's the contribution? Yeah, I mean, and, uh, what's the point of this? Oh, the point of this equation is that what I'm really interested in is not, in fact, to predict the next reward, but to predict the average. Okay, so I'm showing essentially an expression, right, that, that is similar. And, and here the idea is that very often theta will include the mean. So theta is um, the parameterization that we came up with uh, for this here. And then it will often include um, like, let's say this is a Gaussian distribution, right? Then the powders of a Gaussian would include the mean and the variance. So theta would include the mean, right? So, so yeah, that's what I'm showing here that, okay, what I'm really interested in is not so much to make a prediction, but just to look at, at the mean. And, and then in this case, it would really just correspond to my posterior. Right. So yeah, you're, you're right that here, this, this is indeed a conditional distribution, but I've expressed it in a special way where I'm using a semicolon here to indicate that we condition on the parameters. Um, so often we would use a vertical bar whenever we want to express a conditional distribution where we condition on another random variable. But when we condition on parameters, then often we just use semicolon, but it does have the same meaning that it's a conditional distribution where we condition on, on theta. Yeah. OK, so all right. So I, kn I know there's been quite a bit of math so far, but let's look at a simple example to uh, understand better what's going on. So here, um, in this example, I'm going to use a coin. 
um, in fact, two coins that are going to be biased. So there's going to be coin one and coin two. And then for each coin, there's a property that I'm going to get head. And these probabilities can be different. And here, let's formulate the problem where I want to maximize the number of heads that I would obtain in K flips. Okay? So this is essentially a bandit problem, right? Because my two actions are either I flip coin one or I flip coin two. And now I want to maximize the number of heads that I would obtain in K flips. And, and therefore, I need to choose those coins and eventually perhaps converge on the coin that has uh, the highest probability of obtaining head. OK, so in this case, um, we can say that the variables for um, coin 1 and coin 2, so the rewards are 1 or 0. Um, so this would correspond to a Bernoulli variable. Right? So whenever you've got a random variable that just has two possible outcomes, then um, it corresponds to a Bernoulli variable. And then what's interesting about the Bernoulli variable is that its average is denoted by the probability of the outcome 1. Um, so if I use the parameter theta 1 to indicate what is the probability of outcome 1, then it would correspond to the mean or the average reward. And then same thing for coin 2. Okay? So that's a, that's a simplest setting, but it's a convenient setting. OK, so based on this, now we can express a prior distribution. So again, theta is a power that I don't know. If I knew what theta was here, then I would know what is the average reward. And then I could simply select the coin that gives me the highest probability of obtaining heads. But I don't know theta 1 and I don't know theta 2. So here, for a specific theta, if I don't know what it is, then let me express a distribution with respect to theta. So this distribution, because theta can range anywhere between 0 and 1, is going to be a distribution that has support on the interval 0, 1. Um, a convenient distribution is going to be the beta distribution, which has a following algebraic form. So you take theta raised to the power of alpha minus 1, and then 1 minus theta raised to the power of beta minus 1. And this distribution is interesting because at least in the case of, of our example with coin flips, or so otherwise advertising, so for coin flips, alpha minus 1 can be interpreted as the number of times we get heads when we do some flips. And then beta minus 1 could be the number of times we get tail. OK, so here I've got three examples of some beta distributions. So perhaps initially, I might not have any information. And then I could start with beta with, that has parameters 1 and 1. So 1 here corresponds to alpha. And then the other one corresponds to beta. And then if I take alpha minus 1, so this would be 0, and same thing for for beta, beta minus 1 would be 0. So this would correspond to having not done any flips before, having 0 heads, 0 tail. And then as a result, I would have a uniform distribution with respect to the entire interval. OK, now let's say that I start doing some flips. And then at some point, I have alpha is equal to 2, beta is equal to 8 then this could correspond to the green curve. And this would correspond to, let's say, having one head and having 8 minus 1, 7 tail. Okay. Um, and now, if I was going to continue, whenever, uh, let, let's say at some point I've got alpha and beta that are 20 and 80, then this could give me the red curve. And then you can see that it's a curve that it's a lot more narrow, so it's more peaked at, at a certain value. And in fact, the expectation or the average uh, for theta, according to those curves, would be essentially alpha divided by alpha plus beta. So you can see that both the green curve and, and the red curve, they have the same expectation. But in one case, we're a lot more certain, that's the red curve, and a lot less certain for the green curve. OK, so, so we're going to use a beta distribution to characterize 
our uncertainty and then you can interpret those hyperparameters alpha and beta as essentially counts of how many times I've seen head versus tail and the more counts I have the more peak the distribution is going to be and it's going to concentrate near the average that is given by alpha divided by alpha plus beta. Okay. Any questions regarding the beta distribution? Yes. So here we're talking about modeling the prior data. So this wouldn't change though as you preserve more, right? Because the posterior. Right, okay, so I guess yeah, here I'm going to use a beta distribution as the prior. But we're going to see in a moment that it will also be the posterior. And what will happen is that the posterior will correspond to increasing alpha and beta corresponding to the, the flips that I've seen. Yeah. OK, so yeah, let's say that I start with a prior, which is a beta distribution. And here it's parameterized by alpha and beta. In general, what is common is to start with alpha and beta that are equal to 1, but you can start with any values for alpha and beta. So this would correspond to prior knowledge that may correspond to any notion of prior flips that you might have observed um, before you start. Okay, so that's, that's our prior. Now after a coin flip, uh, let's say that we uh, do a coin flip and we get head what we would do is multiply the prior by the likelihood. The likelihood here, if you recall in the case of the Bernoulli distribution, when we get head, the property of head given theta is exactly equal to theta. So then we would multiply our prior by theta, which would effectively increase alpha, where alpha, as we discussed just before, corresponds to counting the number of heads. Right? So naturally, you see when I take my prior and I multiply by the likelihood, I am increasing alpha and then I get um, a posterior which is also a beta distribution and then it has hyper counts alpha plus one and beta. Now if instead I observe tail, then something similar would happen. So I multiply by the prior and the likelihood, but now for the likelihood of tail, it would be one minus theta. Okay, so then I would increase beta instead, and then my posterior would have hyperparameters alpha and beta plus one. Okay, so we're now ready to talk about a first technique. So if we have a posterior distribution, then one way of, um, um, I guess selecting actions that would take into account the posterior distribution is simply to sample from that distribution a good action. So here, um, let's say that I, I have a distribution over what I think is the mean, and then this would be, let's say, modeled by a beta distribution. Then what I could do is sample some possible means and then simply take the average of those to get a good estimate of the true mean. Okay, so this is still going to be an empirical average, but then the idea is that if I get a few samples like this, and that gives me an empirical average, then perhaps I can simply select the action that maximizes this. Okay. So, so this would take into account the fact that we have some uncertainty about theta because here, um, or we have, we have some uncertainty about what we think is the average because we're going to sample possible averages. And then these samples, I'm going to take their average um, and then simply select the action that maximizes that. OK, so in the case of our coin example, right? so this distribution is a beta, and now uh, let's say that this is for a specific action A. So it would have the following hyperparameters alpha A and beta A. And, and then their interpretation again is that this corresponds to the number of heads and the number of tails. Okay, so the Thompson sampling technique uh, with respect to Bernoulli rewards would work as follows. So at every step, 
Um, where here I'm going to index my steps by M. So I'm going to go from step one to step H, where H indicates the horizon of my, so that's my planning horizon. What I'm going to do is simply sample some possible averages for the reward that I can uh, obtain with each action. And then I'm going to form an empirical estimate where I take the average of those averages and then select the action that maximizes that. Okay. Um, then I execute that action. I'm going to receive reward R. And then this reward R is now going to be used to update my posterior distribution with respect to the average reward of A star. Okay. So here when I update this distribution, it would be based on Bayes' theorem that we saw earlier. Um, yeah, right here. Let's see. Yeah, right here. So yeah, it would be based on, on Bayes' theorem here. Okay. And then in the case of um, uh, the Bernoulli, Right, so it would correspond, so if I get a head, it would correspond to this update, and if I get a tail, I, I get this update. Okay. Yeah, so this is a general algorithm. Um, in fact, it, the way it's written here, I guess it, I think it would work even if these are not Bernoulli variables, because here I, I would do the update based on whatever type of variables I would have, and, and then this would just give me uh, perhaps a more precise posterior, and then I would continue in this fashion. Okay. Now, if we compare Thompson sampling with a greedy strategy, so what's interesting is that in both cases, you see we select an action simply by maximizing some empirical estimate of the rewards. Okay. The difference is that here, the empirical estimate would simply be the average of all the rewards that we've observed for this action. Whereas here, we don't take the average of the rewards that we've observed directly. Instead, we form a posterior distribution, and then we sample from that posterior distribution, and then we take the average of those samples. Okay, so, so then you see here, um, we form our our empirical estimate by directly taking the average of, of the rewards that we've observed. So small r means that it's an observed reward. And then here, capital RIA would be essentially a sample from the distribution with respect to what we think is the average reward for um, that particular r. Okay, so that's, that's the main difference, right? So here it's a small r, that's a, an observed reward. And this is a capital R, which means that it's a sample average from our posterior distribution. Okay, so you can see here that the samples are obtained in this fashion, right? Um, and, and here they're obtained directly. Okay. Now, this difference is important because here there is in fact no exploration. What we're doing is simply updating our estimate um, of what we think is the average reward for each action and then selecting actions that maximize this average reward. So, so we're always exploiting, right? Whenever we select this, we're always exploiting. Now in this case, there is going to be some exploration and that depends essentially on the fact that when we sample um, from this distribution, at every step when, whenever we sample from this distribution, we're going to get different samples. So as a result, you see f at one step, we might sample some average rewards here that suggest that action one is better than action two, so we would select action one. But then maybe at the next step, when I produce new samples, then it might be action two that gets lucky and there we're going to sample some, some RIAs that are higher for, for this action. So as a result, um, this process where we first um, compute a posterior distribution and then sample from that, 
allows us to implicitly do some exploration because we're going to select actions based on um, how those samples turned out and then they're different at each time step. Any questions regarding this? Does the I mean there's a uh, time step? Um, okay, right, so I guess, yeah, in, on, this, on this side here, I means that it's a time step. Okay, where at every time step, I get a new observe reward, but not on this side. So here on this side, I means that I simply, it's, it's, it's going to be an index of the sample, um, of the samples that I get from my posterior distribution. What the samples take as every time step? Um, Right, so I guess, I guess, okay, here you see R indexed by I is going to be the same as R indexed, I guess, th th this should be I's as well, but now this should be something else than I. So I guess I will change the slides to make this more clear. Perhaps I should use J to indicate that now I'm going to sample J um, average rewards from the posterior distribution at each time step, okay? So, so then, yeah, on, on this side, this should really be J to indicate that I'm indexing samples from my posterior distribution, but then those samples are different at every time step. Okay, so in Thompson sampling, there's something really interesting, um, which is how the sample size affects the exploration. Okay, so in this algorithm here, you see when I form an empirical mean, it is based on k samples. Um, those k samples are, are obtained from, from the posterior distribution. But now, if I choose k to be really large, right, then I'm going to get a really accurate estimate. And then I'm going to be mostly doing exploitation. But if I choose k to be small, then I get a noisy estimate and then I will do more exploration. So in Thonson sampling, um, the amount of sampling that we do, um, so here the sample size k will regulate the amount of exploration. Okay, so in Thonson sampling, you see as n increases, where n is the number of true rewards that we observe, then we can form a posterior distribution that becomes more and more peaked over time. Right? So it's going to be a better distribution that just becomes more and more peaked. But then for each of those posterior or beta distributions, I'm going to sample some um, estimates of what I think is the average reward, and I'm going to sample k of them. Now, as I choose K, uh, if I choose K to be really large, then I'm going to get a good estimate. But if I choose K to be small, then I get a noisy estimate. And then uh, it's actually a good thing to choose a K that is not too large. Okay, so here, if K um, approaches infinity, then I would get here um, the, the mean of my posterior distribution. And then the mean of my posterior distribution would be very precise. It would be no uncertainty, and therefore I would not do any exploration because I would always get the same thing. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's kind of a little bit counterintuitive because in general, whenever we approximate expectations by sampling, the intuition is that we want to sample some we want to get a sample size that is as large as possible so that we can get a good estimate. But in this case here, we're, we don't want to necessarily do that. We want to get just a, a small sample size so that it will reflect the fact that there's some uncertainty still in what we think is the average, and, and then we will naturally explore as a result. Okay, so. Now you might ask, how well does Thompson sampling perform in practice? Uh, so you can show that Thompson sampling will converge to the best arm. Um, the, the rate of convergence depends on the sample size k. But nevertheless, uh, we can also show in theory that the cumulative regret 
is going to grow logarithmically, which is optimal, and that's on par with UCB and epsilon greedy. Okay, and now you might ask, okay, what is a sample size that is often used in practice? Well, in practice, k is often set to one. Um, that's both because computationally, if you choose a small sample size, it's faster, so might as well go for something small. And as we just discussed, if we choose k to be small, then this will ensure that, that there's a more exploration. Um, so, so yeah, so this will favor exploration because our estimate is going to be noisy. However, as we get more and more data, the distribution is going to be peaked. And then in the limit, if you just get one sample, right? So if this distribution is, is essentially a direct delta, right? Then the expectation could be well approximated by a single sample. So, so then that's why it's okay to just choose one sample because um, the amount of exploration is going to naturally reduce due to the fact that this distribution becomes more and more peaked over time. Okay, so um, Thompson sampling is actually used quite a bit in practice um, because it is uh, quite simple based on, on what we just saw. Um, and then it is used in the industry, uh, but it is used in the context of what are known as contextual bandits. So I will have to introduce that. Yes? Uh That's right, yeah. Uh, so then what do you consider a sample Well, so a, a sample is going to be a sample from our beta distribution. Um, so okay, th this would be a beta distribution, and then a sample would be an, an average reward that, that we sample from this. So if I just go back, um, you see, let's say that my beta distribution is the red curve, right? Now I would sample from this distribution, which would give me a number between zero and one, okay? And then that number is likely to be near the peak, okay? So, so it's so essentially sampling an average reward, because the actual reward at any point in time is either going to be one or zero, because we said that in the case of Bernoulli variables, right, just like uh, the click-through, right, so either somebody clicks or not, and therefore there's a payment or there's no payment. So here, same thing. Normally, the reward is zero or one, but now if we wanna come up with an estimate of the, re, uh, of the average reward, then it should be a number between zero and one, right? And then um, what, when, whenever we sample, we get a number that's between zero and one. Okay, so I guess, yeah, sampling from a beta distribution that's beta with hyperparameters 2.8 versus 20.80. Uh, so um, I, I, I guess, yeah, sampling directly from a beta distribution is not something easy, but then there are, um, in most packages like NumPy um, and other scientific programming packages, there are routines that are available for, for sampling from beta distribution. Essentially, you, you would pass in um, those parameters, and then it would return for you a number between zero and one. How do you know that this uh, two and eight, How do we know that uh, we have a better distribution that's two eight versus twenty eighty? Okay, so so here, um, at every step, you see, whenever we get uh, to observe a true reward, right? Then it would be either tail or head, and then we would update alpha or beta by incrementing it by one. So initially we start with, let's say, alpha and beta that are both equal to one. Then let's say we observe tail, so now alpha becomes two. Then let's say a tail again, alpha becomes three, and so on. So you see it will increase. Maybe at some point it will be equal to two and eight. Maybe later it will become equal to 20 and 80.
That's right. So yeah, Thomson sampling can be used for with any distribution. The idea is that um, yeah, you you normally you would like to select an action that gives you the highest reward. But then if we're uncertain about the reward, then we can compute a posterior distribution over what those rewards are and then simply use Thomson sampling that would sample some possible reward, select the best one, but then because at each step, whenever we sample some possible rewards like that, then we're going to get different actions that will turn out to be best, and then this will naturally lead to some amount of exploration. Yeah, and then so yeah, it, it can be a better distribution, or it could be a Gaussian, or it could be any other type of distribution. Yeah. Um, so in the general case, how do we know how many thetas we need? Uh, so okay, the, the number of thetas here in general would be dependent on how many actions we have. So every action, there's some rewards, and then we're going to model the distribution over the rewards of that action, and then we're going to need some parameters for that distribution, right? right. So, so, so if we don't know the distribution, then how, like, is scale, is the uh, theta always a scalar, or can it be a vector? Oh, right, okay, so yeah, th theta could be a vector. So like, let's say we, we consider Gaussians, okay, so like, let's say, Instead of having Bernoulli variables, we have a Gaussian variable. Then for the Gaussian, we need the mean and the standard deviation. So it would be a vector of size 2. Right. So, so like what if we don't know whether it's a Gaussian or some other distribution? OK. Yeah. So what, what if we don't know what is the type of distribution? So here we could consider non-parametric uh, distributions. Um, so it, in, in fact, in that case, then you could say that Whenever we say non-parametric, it's a bit of a misnomer because it doesn't mean that there's no parameters. It simply means that we're not assuming any parameterization, and in fact, the number of parameters grows with the amount of data. Okay, so so it is possible to avoid making any parametric assumptions. We don't have to assume that it's a Gaussian or that it's a, a Bernoulli, and and then we could uh, simply have um, uh, some, some, something that characterizes the distribution based on the amount of data that we have, and then we'll um, model arbitrarily closely in any distribution in the limit. Wait, yeah. don't you need an infinite number of parameters? Yes, so yes, so in the limit you need an infinite number of parameters, but we're never in the limit, right? So in practice we always only have a finite amount of data, and therefore, you would just need a vector that, that's finite. The trouble, though, is that for those non-parametric methods, then the, the parameterization increases with the amount of data. So if you have lots of data, then it just becomes intractable at some point. Okay. So, so, so how do you solve the problem in practice if you don't know the distribution? Right. Okay. So in practice, you eventually end up making a parametric assumption one way or the other because yeah, you, you typically need to bound your representation. Um, so, so yeah, so I guess non-parametric representations are often nice, at least in theory, for us to think about how we could get something that's very flexible, but in practice, we typically end up approximating them back with something that's parametric. Yeah. Yeah. So we assume like each action is independent, like the distribution for this. So each action is what? Independent. Infinite? Independent. Like oh, independent. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so here, that's the assumption we're making. So all the actions, whenever we execute them, they're independent, right? So it's, it's like taking a dice, rolling it, and each time you roll it, right, the outcome is, is going to be independent from the previous outcomes, okay? Yeah. So you're asking here, what is the meaning of the V that we return? Yeah, yeah okay, so here this is going to be the average, um, oh, th this is the sum of the rewards 
that we've obtained through all of our trials. Well, okay, so here the meaning of V is simple, is just the sum of the rewards for all the actions that we've tried. Now, those actions, as you pointed out, we try to select them in a smart way, right? And then we select them so that they correspond to having perhaps the largest estimate of the, the average rewards, right? Uh, but then this estimate is noisy, right? So we're not always going to select the best action. But then the idea is that over time, right, then this will converge in a way where our posterior distribution is going to be quite peaked for each action because we're going to try them infinitely often. Once they are peaked, doing a one sample approximation of the expectation is the same as, as having the expectation itself and then we're going to essentially select the best action. So in the limit, we're going to be selecting always the best action. Um, and then as a result, we could say that here V is going to be in the limit, the sum of the best rewards that we can obtain from the best action. But before we get to the limit, right, then we're going to be sometimes executing some suboptimal actions. And then this is just keeping track of the sum of the rewards. Okay, so think of this as like in the context of um, online advertising, right? At the end of the day, what, the, does the, what do the managers care about, right? It's how much money you're going to make, right? So here, you're going to display some ads. Sometimes they get clicked on, sometimes they don't. And what you want to report is that perhaps over a period of, I don't know, one week, um, there was a certain number of ads that were clicked on, and that led to a revenue that corresponds to V. Yes, the goal is to maximize the revenue. Yeah. So when we select the action which uh, maxi we, have, uh, we select the action which maximizes uh, the capital are high, right? So that's just a, an estimate, right? Why don't we take into account the uncertainty of it? So it, it is somewhat taking into account the uncertainty because you see R hat is sampled. Uh, well, okay, R hat comes from taking the average of all the RIAs, and the RIAs are sampled from the posterior, okay? So when, when I get this sample, right, it's going to be different each time, right? And then because I'm going to get different samples, I'm going to get different empirical averages here, and, and then so over time it will reflect the fact that I'm uncertain because I won't be always getting the same thing. That means like uh, we can get a confidence interval of uh, our hat, right? So why don't we use that? I mean, there is an upper bound, just like the UCB. Why don't we use that method? Well, okay, yeah. Why don't we use UCB? Yes, we can use UCB, oh, yes. and that's why we covered UCB earlier. Okay, so if, if we take the confidence interval, the upper bound of the confidence interval. This is this method is a, like a, exactly the same as the UCB. Right? right. Yeah. So if we use an upper confidence bound. Um, for our posterior, then yes, it, this would boil down to UCB or otherwise some variant of UCB. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Where were we? Um, okay. Yeah. So I was going to introduce contextual bandits um, because okay, Thompson sampling is used um, quite a bit in practice. Um, it is simple. It works well. Um, but then in practice. What is often used is not just pure bandits, but what are known as contextual bandits. The idea is that in, in the industry, let's say we're doing online advertising, or otherwise, uh, let's say that we're trying to develop personalized user interfaces, what you would like to do is not just select actions and, and then observe the rewards, but select actions based on the context, right? So the context can provide us a lot of information that will help us determine before we do any type of experimentation about what might be the best action. And then in some cases, um, you might all have already some experience with, let's say, um, certain um, actions in some context, but now you're in a new context, and then perhaps you can transfer some of that experience 
And, and then contextual bandwidths essentially allow us to do that. OK, so here, yeah, the example would be personalized advertising. So you've probably noticed this already whenever you go on a web page. And then a lot of the ads uh, that you get are going to be different than the ads that your neighbor is going to get because uh, Google and other companies essentially display ads that will take into account previous websites that you visited. If you've logged in, it would take into account as well your demographics information, so your age, your gender, your location, etc. Okay, and then and then so the idea is that the ads are supposed to be more relevant. Um, and then there's a higher probability that because of that you're going to click on the ad, right? And now that's not just for advertising, for any type of personalization. So now a lot of companies are trying to develop web pages or user interfaces that are going to be personalized. So the information that they display to you, right, they would like it to be more relevant. Um, so, so yeah, so the common type of context that is used is demographics, but in general, um, it, it can be anything. Uh, now the other interesting part are the actions as well. The actions could be characterized by some features, right? So in the case of ads or web pages, um, they often have some features where you could categorize ads or web pages based on topics, based on keywords, and, and so on. Um, if it is, if there's also some, some graphics in there, you might be able to identify what are the objects in, in the graphics and then these could also serve as, as features, right? So, so then you can think of the arms now as being parameterized by some features and then you want to take that into account too. So basically we want to take into account the context and the features before we select each action. Okay, so a contextual bandit is going to be a generalization of a regular bandit. Um, and, and then it's a generalization that takes into account the context as well as the features. So the context is going to essentially define a notion of state. So earlier we said that for bandits, there was no notion of state, or in other words, we were always in the same state. But now for contextual bandit, there's going to be a different state. So whenever um, a user is on a web page and now an ad needs to be displayed, well, the web page as well as um, the user demographics define the context, they define the state, right? And then you might want to display a different ads depending on, on that. So, yeah, so here we're going to characterize a state by a vector of features. I'm going to denote this by x. So bolded x to indicate that it's a, a vector of features. And same thing for actions. So each action a now is going to have a vector of features. I'm going to call it x a, and that's the vector for action a. OK, so, so then in contextual bandits, we have states, we have actions, and we also have some rewards. But then again, the main difference is that now we have multiple states as opposed to one state, and then the actions have some features. Now, there is still no transition function. So what happens is that at any point in time, right, when you're asked to choose an action, you're going to be in a state, but that state has no dependence on any previous state. So it's a little bit weird because when I said there's no transition, well, the state does change, because every time you select an action, there's going to be a different state. But the problem is that you can't predict what that next state is going to be. Right? So there's no correlation between the state. So from that perspective, we say that we don't need to worry about any transition function because it's completely independent. OK, so then the goal is going to be to find a policy, which is a mapping from states to actions. and here, ideally, what we would like to do is to maximize the expected rewards. In other words, um, we would like to find the action that maximizes rewards based on the state feature and the action features. Okay? Yeah, so that's our goal. 
Okay, so a common approach here would be to learn an approximate average reward function. Um, so as before, we could have our tilde that is going to be an approximation um, for uh, the reward of a certain action. And then here, let me use x to be the vector that concatenates all the state features and all the action features. Okay, so I'm going to denote my reward as a function of x, and, and that takes into account both s and a. So now, if those features are quite uh, detailed, and perhaps the reward that I would obtain based on those features could be, um, there could be some dependencies that, that, that are complex, perhaps um, there's, there is some underlying function r, but I, I would like to approximate it maybe with a linear function or something nonlinear like a neural network. Okay, so in practice, uh, the reward function can be approximated by a linear combination of the features or something nonlinear like a neural network. Okay, so now let's say that we go ahead with a linear approximation. I'm going to show you now how we could do this, um, how we could come up with a, a Bayesian, um, yeah, a Bayesian contextual bandit that will assume a, 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 a linear approximation. And then because of the linear approximation, we're going to be implicitly doing linear regression. So, okay, here, um, if I just go back, my reward function is going to be parameterized by some weights. Okay, so whether it's linear or nonlinear, I'm going to have some weights. So here, let's assume that um, I start with a prior distribution because I'm going to be Bayesian. I don't know what the weights are. So the weights W here are the parameters. Earlier I was using theta as a parameter. Now I'm using W as a parameter, but it's the same thing. So now I'm going to start with some distribution over the parameters because I don't know what that, those parameters are, so I have to characterize my uncertainty. So I'm going to be Bayesian. So perhaps one simple way of doing this is that I could say, well, I don't know what W is, but let me start with a Gaussian prior. A Gaussian distribution is simple and nice. And perhaps here I could just assume that my weights are going to be close to zero, and then there's going to be some variance and then, so this would be the form of my prior distribution. Now, if I know the weights, then perhaps the reward that I would observe, let's say that it is really a linear combination of the features, could also be modeled with a Gaussian distribution, where what I would say is that really uh, my reward is going to be approximately a linear combination of the features, plus a little bit of noise that's governed by the variance here, sigma square. Okay, so it would be modeled in this way. So now, once I have the prior and the likelihood, if I'm being Bayesian, I'm going to compute a posterior. So in this case, uh, in the, with, with Gaussians, what's nice is that I get a posterior that is also Gaussian. So this is an analog to what we saw with the beta distribution. You start with a beta distribution for the prior, and then you multiply by the likelihood, and you get a better distribution for the posterior. So here, with Gaussians, there's something similar where we stay in the Gaussian family. Um, so I would multiply the prior by the likelihood, get uh, a posterior, and then the posterior will have a mean mu and here a covariance matrix sigma that is obtained through this calculation. Okay. So here I'm not showing you the steps, but essentially if you, if you multiply these two exponentials, reorganize the terms, you could rewrite this in the form of a Gaussian that would have a mean mu that's determined by this expression and a covariance matrix that is determined by this expression. Okay, so this process um, is known as Bayesian linear regression because what I'm really doing is trying to find the best set of weights that could uh, explain how I could obtain the rewards that I observe by a linear combination of, of the input features. Okay, so 
Um, once I have my posterior distribution, I can compute what is known as the predictive posterior, so I can make a prediction about the next reward. And then, uh, same as before, what we would do is integrate out W. So I have here predictions based on the likelihood, and then uh, I have uncertainty expressed by the posterior. These are two Gaussians. I multiply them, I integrate out W, and then it remains Gaussian. So Gaussians are nice as well because all the manipulations we do remain Gaussian. So this would be the uh, predictive posterior. Now, let's say that we want to come up with an upper bound in the posterior on that reward R. Um, we can do this. We can obtain an upper confidence bound that will be similar to what we did before. Um, and then the following expression will work. So we can simply bound R with this expression. Uh, here, there is a, a constant C. Um, and then the idea is that with the Gaussian distribution, um, I can impose a bound, and then this bound will hold with a certain probability. Um, and then the bound and the probability are, are, are related according to this expression. Okay, so I'm, I'm not showing you the full derivation of how we arrive at that, but uh, this would require a bit more knowledge about uh, probabilities and statistics. But in any case, um, this is the expression we, we would arrive at. Okay, now if we wanted to do Thomson sampling instead, what we would do is simply use this posterior distribution and then sample R directly from that posterior distribution. Okay, so I guess what I've just done here is show you how in the case of um, uh, some reward function that would be approximated through a linear expression, right, then I can compute the posterior and then after that impose a bound that gives us UCB or I can do Thomson sampling and then these two approaches will, will work. Okay. Um, okay, so let's put that into an algorithm. Let's say that now we consider the upper confidence bound version for linear Gaussian um, rewards. So we have a similar algorithm as before, um, but then you'll notice that you see our confidence bound, right, is determined by this expression here. That's the main difference. And then we select the action that simply maximizes the confidence bound. Okay. Now if we do the same thing with Thompson sampling, then here we would sample some rewards from our posterior distribution and, and then compute an empirical average and then uh, select the action that maximizes that. So this would be the Thomson sampling version uh, of the algorithm. Yeah? So the update mu and sigma, the variance of the mean here, that's based on the Bayes rule still. So is that correct? Yes, that's right. So yeah. So the updates, uh, so whenever I write here update mu and sigma, so that's based on Bayes' rule, where I'm computing a posterior distribution um, that takes into account one more data sample. Right. So we yeah. over all the samples that we've seen so far from the That's right. So, so here we kind of do it incrementally, right? Because at every step, right? So at every iteration here, I'm going to get a new sample that corresponds to state S and action A. And then I can use that now to update my posterior distribution. Yeah, and, and then it's the same thing in, in both algorithms. Yeah. Okay, so these algorithms are actually used quite a bit in the industry. Um, and then as a, as a concrete example, uh, MSN News, so this is Microsoft. Um, so in 2016, they essentially switched from um, using heuristic rules with human involvement to using contextual bandits in terms of displaying news articles that would be personalized based on the context of each user. So when they did that, um, they observed that the click-through rate increased by 26%. Um, 
And, and then they attribute this to, to the adoption of contextual bandits. So if you want, you can read the following blog that tells you more about uh, when they did that switch and, and then the results that they obtained. Okay. So, so yeah, so this is just an example, but then um, throughout the industry for social media, whenever you want to do something personalized, right, that takes into account the context, then contextual bandits are a good approach. And, and then what's nice is that you see this is fully automated. Um, so as we saw, uh, you see as you get more and more data, then you update your posterior, and then you, you can gradually discover what it is that each person, or otherwise each context, might prefer in terms of action, and then improve your payoff ratio or improve your click-through rate. Yeah. So um, what can you do if your state is discrete and not vectorial? OK, so if the state is discrete, um, it, I mean, nothing changes. So here you see. Um, I can have, um, so yeah, so XS is the features that correspond to the state description, but then those features could all be discrete, which would give you a discrete state overall. So in fact, in practice, is often what happens. So um, in, in social media, often the, the, the feature vector is, is often discretized, even it's often Boolean. Um, and, and then, so yeah, so this, this would not be an issue. Uh, is this the uh, optimal action? Is this the, the optimal one for, the, for each time step? Or is it optimal for, for every time step? Um, is it optimal for each time step or every time step? So, <coughs> so it's trying to be optimal with respect to the empirical estimate that we have here which is different in the case of Thompson sampling at each time step, okay? But it is not optimal overall because that's an empirical estimate, right? And that's noisy. Then how can you shoot that for the, for the total value? That is the sum of the reward. Could it be the optimal reward is the, for the whole process? Um, for the return you get. Yeah, so I guess this, what this algorithm does is it tries to return a V that's going to be as large as possible. So you've got some horizon H, right? So you know that you're going to, let's say, display, uh, let, or you, let's say that there's going to be H um, possible occasions for you to display an ad, right? So then uh, you'd like to maximize uh, your, pay, your, your payout um, or your payoff, so, so then uh, that's what V corresponds to. So am, yeah. I, am I answering your question? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Another thing is that's the action also optimal for the, for, uh, just for a one state or because that's we introduce the state. So I don't know whether it's optimal for every state or. Ah, yeah, okay, good point. So yeah, so here, um, because it's a contextual bandit, right, as we discussed, at every time step, so at, um, every n, so here time steps are, are denoted by n, right? Then we are in a different state. So yeah, so here it is trying to choose whatever action would be optimal for that state. But due to noise, it might be suboptimal. And, and here the states, we have no control over them, right? So basically you see users will just go on different web pages and then ads need to be served wherever they happen to go. Right? So, so then as a result, we don't have any control over states. They're going to be whatever, uh, wherever people happen to go. Right? And, and now we need to serve ads. So, so then we, we are going to select ads that hopefully are going to maximize the click-through rate or the probability of triggering out a, a payment. Yeah. Well, those case samples, 
Um, again, as I explained earlier, k is often going to be equal to 1, first of all. Right? And here, um, they're just there to, um, I guess, expose the fact that we have some uncertainty regarding the average reward. Right? So, so then we just sample once. That gives us a sampled average reward. And then in some cases, one action is going to be the one that has this highest sample and will be chosen. In other cases, it's going to be another action, which will then lead to some exploration naturally. So here it's a special case where we're not trying to extract as much information as possible, because extracting as much information as possible would mean sampling as much as possible, and then we would get an accurate estimate of the mean, and there would be no exploration. Yeah. Well, so, so here, um, yeah, there, there, there's many time steps, right? Um, and you're asking, what about the last time step? Should we just be greedy? Um, yes, so if we have a finite horizon, uh, you're right that at that point, there's like the, the whole point of exploring is so that it helps us to make better choices in, in the future. Yeah, so you're right that here, at the last step, at H, perhaps we don't need to explore. So then we should not, um, well, so I guess if we don't want to explore, in the case of Thompson sampling, we could simply take the expectation directly and then maximize that as opposed to sampling. Um, but then, okay, what will typically happen in practice is H is going to be fairly large. And then you're going to get a lot of data that will allow you to compute a posterior distribution that will already be very peaked. So then if, if it is very peaked, then you're not exploring anymore, even if you just take one sample. Because if you have a direct delta distribution, that distribution, its mean can be um, estimated exactly with one sample. Right? Because every sample is going to give you the same thing. So that's, that's the reason why, even though you're right that here we should do something different at the last time step, in practice, it doesn't make a difference. Well, this, theoretically, doesn't that prove that this algorithm is not optimal? Well, so, OK, yeah, the, this, this algorithm is not uh, necessarily optimal in the sense that um, we, we should be computing expectation, the, ex, the expectation of the value of the information that is uh, obtained through exploration and so on, but that's intractable. So I, in fact, I did not cover what would be the optimal approach here because it is quite complex. So this is still an, an, an approximation, but that uses the posterior distribution. Right, so yeah, so you're right that here in the limit, this will converge to a frequentist estimate because whenever the distribution is peaked, then just getting one sample is the same as having the distribution. And, and then, yeah, so, so then this, this would converge. Um, but now, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Right, okay, so, so here, I guess, I guess we never explicitly say, I stop exploring. Right? So that's, that's the beauty of this algorithm, that it, it automatically regulates for us how much exploration we do versus exploitation. So we don't have to make that decision, because whenever you, you force people to make that decision, often they make mistakes. Right? They either uh, stop exploring too early or too late, and, and this does it for, for us. So obviously, yeah, there, there's probably ways of optimizing this manually so that it's better. But, but this is automatic and, and yeah, it, it works nicely. I guess I should mention that also in practice, often the environment is non-stationary. So you could imagine that you see the click-through rate for an ad will vary over time simply because of people's preferences, because of all kinds of external events uh, that influence, I guess, the interest that people have. So here, what I'm not showing either is that typically what you want to do is when you compute your posterior, you don't want to let it become too peaked, right? You want to, in fact, make sure that the variance uh, remains above some threshold so that it can keep on always having a little bit of uncertainty and therefore adapt to any changes, right? And, and this will take care of, of non-stationarity.
Okay, one last question. So I still want to argue why we don't use the, the upper bound for the capital R hat. I mean, uh, that confident, like uh, that upper bound is different from uh, each individual R. I, right? so okay, if, if you want to use an upper bound, I mean, here's the algorithm, right? Yeah, so. It's a different one. It's in a, uh, but in the, in the Thompson sampling, we already take the sampling, right? So that confidence takes into account the sampling process, right? So it's like two different upper bounds, right? Uh, sorry, what, what's the upper bound in Thompson so sampling? The upper bound is uh, the average of uh, K, like uh, R, I, right? K individual R, I's. Yeah. But this I got this upper bound is like a, the average of kind of like a K reward. Like a, okay, so I, I wouldn't call this an upper bound. So it's simply an estimate. Yeah, okay. But that's also and then kind of because variable. there's uncertainty, right? Sometimes the estimates for one action are gonna be higher than another action, and sometimes it's going to be the other action that has a higher estimate. So as a result we're going to explore naturally. Yeah. But there's no notion of upper bound here. These are just noisy estimates, and we're exploiting the noise to drive the exploration. Yeah, so even if we maximize r hat, r hat is not an upper bound. r hat is an empirical average that comes from those samples, right? So it's not an upper bound in any fashion. Yeah, but for each individual ri, that's also a random variable, right? So now you take like the average of uh, k different like variables. There is also a kind of uh, like uncertainty with it, right? Well, okay, let, here let's think of this instead of samples. They're not random variables per se, so they're, they're samples, right? And then, yes, there, there is uncertainty, and that's why the samples are going to be different each time. Okay, anyway, let's, um, let's conclude this. Um, so, in fact, I think this was the last slide. Yes, it is. Okay, so let's stop here.